invading Iraq by kicking out Saddam as, as terrible and brutal a guy as he was, um, we have brought about the growth of this terrible fundamentalism. We've made the Muslim, we've caused the Muslim world to regress. And I don't, I don't, I think that sending in the 82nd Airborne can only push us in a reverse direction. I'm wondering if your views have changed since the war started and um, if you think the war was a good idea or if it's going well. Well, without, um, <clears throat> without having what I'm very willing to have in the time we've got an argument in detail on Iraq, I can tell you immediately how I disagree with you. You give away the entire argument when you say they only get angry because of what we do. That was what was said about September the 11th as well. That's what's said about everything that the United States or the West does. We've made them angry. It's not because of the failed state created by Islamic backwardness that turns into a rogue state because it can't blame itself for its failure and exports the violence. That can't be it. It must be something we've done. That's, you stated the ground of my disagreement with you absolutely perfectly. I won't listen to a bar of that song. The problem is, and I shouldn't have to be saying this to an audience of unbelievers, the problem is the religion to begin with. And the oppression that it promulgates, the violence that it preaches, the way that it denies rights to half of its citizens by <coughs> virtue of their gender, the dreams of conquest that it inculcates into children and so forth. No, we can't make that any worse by fighting it. We do not, we do not create jihad by resisting it. We just don't resist it enough. We let Iraq rot for far too long. Far too long. We should have taken care of that a long time ago. And we need to be training an army that is willing to fight in this way, in the, in the most bizarre and ghastly and unpredictable circumstances, as we are doing, an army that's trained to fight and really kill in order to defend us. And if you think that that idea is more dangerous than the idea of an Iranian theocracy waltzing past the European Union, spitting its way through the United Nations, tearing up all the treaties it's ever signed as it goes, laughing at us, sending death squads to kill our novelists, sending death squads to blow up the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires, sending killers with impunity to Berlin to kill the Kurdish democratic leadership of Iran in a restaurant in Germany, doing all this and never suffering a thing and then about to become thermonuclear. If you don't think that's the most dangerous thing, then you have no concept of what a threat religion can really be. And you don't see it when it's glaring you in the face. So don't clap. I don't care. Uh, I have recollections of uh, growing up uh, being schooled uh, as a youngster in Catholicism and I remember having uh, doubts about God and and then I remember reading history books uh, you know describing kings and, and their activity and I thought one equated with the other God sort of was a, um, recreated with the idea of kings and now I I feel with what's going on in this country in terms of uh, the administration uh, trying to create and make imperial the unitary executive. Uh, I feel that that also equates with the king and with God and that we should be resisting as much as we can and for that reason, that is the reason I think we should impeach Cheney and Bush for doing that, and as as a sidebar, I would say ideally we prob probably should impeach Congress as well for for their accommodation. While we're at it, well, I'm tempted to take that as a comment, but um, I'll simply add. Uh, I remember John Ashcroft, Bush's first Attorney General, saying, um, making the statement, in the United States, we have no king but Jesus. <laughs> A statement that is exactly two words too long. Um, and is in need of a, an abrupt circumcision uh, to cut it down to size, uh, cut itself down to size. I'm a, as if, if you care, 
I'm a named plaintiff in the lawsuit brought by the American Civil Liberties Union against the National Security Agency and the Justice Department on the warrantless wiretapping. We, we won the first round in a court in uh, Michigan. And we've, um, but no, it, I, I have to I, I just, uh, I knew if you ever clapped, it would be the wrong moment. Um, when I, I write for, uh, for um, Free Inquiry magazine, I wrote a column that some of you probably see, and uh, it depresses me that the impression given by that magazine most of the time is that in order to read it, you should be a liberal Democrat. I think that's a dangerous and foolish thing to be doing. There are a lot of people uh, who are not Democrats and not liberals who perfectly understand the separation between church and state. There are a lot of right-wing atheists, some of them, I'm afraid to say, fans of the unreadable novels of Ayn Rand and so forth, but it's this... <laughs> This is not, this, I wouldn't come, I would not come to this gathering if I thought it was trying to elect a fool like Barack Obama uh, to be President of the United States. That was what I was here. I wouldn't do it. Okay? Let alone a really, a really wicked person like Hillary Clinton, a faith-based frump like Hillary Clinton. I wouldn't do it, okay? And if you ask me who I'd vote for tomorrow, it would be Rudy Giuliani. And if you don't like it, you can take a number, get online and suck my thumb. <laughs> You were talking about Iranian theocracy and the need to oppose it, but it's one thing to say, you know, it's bad, but what do you, what do you think we do about it? We demolish its uh, nuclear facilities. Air, like we, say, we, say, we make it very plain, the day will never dawn when that regime of the Pazderan Revolutionary Guard has nuclear weapons at its disposal. That will never happen. And when they say, what do you mean by that? We say, we just said what we meant. And we can make good on it. Yeah. If that helps to demolish the theocracy as well, all to the good. But for now, our existence is incompatible with nuclear armed theocracy, and can I really not be pushing at an open door saying that in this room? Evidently not. Okay, let's see. Demolish it, and try and bring down the regime at the same time. It's a no-brainer. I'm uh, curious about many things about you. Uh, curious here by the moment with the Rudy Giuliani thing, but I'll limit myself to uh, <coughs> One of the things in your book, you apparently spent uh, quite a bit of time with uh, Rajneesh Bhagwan back in the 80s. Yes. And I'm curious as to, were you there for enlightenment or expose of him, or what was the situation? What were you looking for there? Um, I've had various experiences with um, Eastern religious uh, gurus and godmen, and, um, preachers of the enlightened path, and one of them was with the man Nagon, reincarnated as Osho, if you follow the, uh, the cult press, um, with the same picture of the same flowing robed and flowing bearded man, who was then known as Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Bhagwan basically means God, Sri means holy, Rajneesh was his name. He had a group of orange-robed um, rich people in a, an ashram in Pune, near, outside Bombay in India in the 80s. It was a very fashionable resort for American and European wealthy seekers in that period. And he had the largest collection of Rolls Royces then of anyone except uh, President Brezhnev of the Soviet Union. And the BBC paid me to go and pretend to be an acolyte and put on an orange robe and go to this ashram, which is one of the most amusing weeks of my life, actually. Um, it got tiring at times. I mean, it was essentially sex and drugs and rock and roll, and I thought, the BBC is paying for this. Um, <laughs> But there was the spiritual side, too. You had to listen to these bloody uh, addresses in the morning, and, and you had to be sniffed on your way in by two very beautiful girls in case you were wearing the wrong kind of aftershave and the pain it brings them and the angst and the anxiety and the questioning and the doubt. That this is actually a very dangerous tendency, I think. It's, it's obvious to me that many of our fellow creatures would rather do without their minds. And they'd rather have reassurance. They'd rather have bliss. They'd, I keep being told, if you only accept nirvana, and that the essence of the all is the Godhead of the true. You know, you'd have happiness and uh, you'd be free from anxiety and stress and so on. Well, I don't want it. I like anxiety. I like stress. <laughs> I like doubt and argument and these things. If, you, if, if I thought you would give me this, I would hate it. I wouldn't want it. It's an offer not worth having. But one of our antagonists, we have to understand in this argument, is not just the people who farm and exploit credulity and so-called spirituality and faith. Not just the people who farm it and exploit it, um, but, the, but the people who want it to be true, the people who would rather dwell in the realm of illusion 
and delusion, many of whom are our fellow citizens. And that's our cultural project, is to try and raise them above the level where charlatanry can poison their lives. Oh. My question <clears throat> is, um, what do you think the consequences will be for here in the United States if we um, leave Iraq um, and the theocrats or whoever take over? Well, we won't let the theocrats take over Iran. I can tell you now, there's too much oil in Iraq for us to let it be controlled by our enemies. This seems to be an axiom. I don't understand why it's so difficult for people to grasp. Actually, I do understand, because apparently oil is a substance almost obscene, like some ghastly bodily secretion that can't be mentioned. Um, I don't feel about that way. I don't feel that way about oil. I think it's a very important economic resource. Uh, we would be hard-pressed without it, as would our allies in Europe and elsewhere. Um, Iraq is a keystone state in the region and a choke point in the world economy. It shouldn't have been ever controlled.